and begin today's webinar. Uh, we've got a lot of people who have joined us today and we've got a lot to cover so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Trey Bean. I'm the product manager for Kowali Research and um, I will be the host for this webinar today. With that said, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Uh, her name is Susan Sorensen. Many of you probably had a chance to interact with her. She is our product owner for the research administration modules within Kuali Research. Susan, when it comes to subject matter expertise around these modules, there really is no one better. She's had over a decade of experience uh, doing research administration and business analysis, working directly with Drexel University and Johns Hopkins. She's, her experience has taken her both through departmental and central research offices, covering both pre- and post-award functions. During her time at both of those institutions, she's helped both of them implement early, some of the early versions of Koali Research, and has also participated in the Koali Coleus Community Subcommittees, serving as chairs and just an overall <laughs> good person to have having those conversations about how to use quality research to, uh, to get get the job done. So I'm really excited to have Susan talk to you today about proposal budgeting. So over to you, Susan. Thanks, Trey. That was a, a nice introduction. Um, so proposal budgeting can be um, a really sticky situation, really difficult because whether you're a research administrator who's going in and working on these proposals or your research leadership trying to make these decisions about what's best for your institution. Budgets are just very large and very difficult most of the time. There's um, not a whole lot of consistency when you look at the big picture of all the different sponsors you have and so we needed to make sure that we had a really flexible system to meet these various needs. And with that in mind, we also have various needs for um, large institutions versus small institutions. And so the first thing that you need to think about, we need to think about when we go into a budget situation is, first of all, what are their sponsor requirements? So if you have a proposal that's going to AHA, that's going to be totally different than if you have something going to Pfizer or something going to DARPA or something going to NIH <coughs> or just like a local little community um, that's going to give you a gift to do something. So the sponsor requirements are the first thing that we'll have to consider when we determine the type of budget that we're going to do in quality research. Uh, the second layer there that we need to consider is what your particular institution is going to require. So leadership will make a decision there, and if your leadership pay attention to this, about what's important to the institution and what type of granularity they're going to want to see when it comes to the reporting that they will want to know about proposals that have been submitted and the dollar amounts that have been submitted. For some institutions, they really just need to be collecting that as high level information, the directs, the indirects. Other institutions, they want to have all of that information, all of the detailed expenses gathered. If you are an institution that decides to use the full suite of Koali research, then you might want to decide to do a detailed budget because we do have the ability to pull the proposal budget, the proposal detailed budget, into the award budget at that time of awarding. So that's something else to consider when you're making your budget. And then last of all, <laughs> unfortunately last in this list, becomes us, the person who's going in and actually entering the budget information and what makes their life easier so that they can get through this process as soon as possible and without, as <laughs> without a lot of headaches. Okay, so we'll keep that in mind when we make our next set of decisions. So we'll look at the various ways that you can enter a budget today. Um, that we can do those really simple, high-level budgets that just talk about the directs and in the indirects. There's also the possibility to do a budget where it's still a summary budget, but you're doing a summary of personnel by category, and by doing it by category, you can also have the system automatically calculate the fringe that's associated by that category type um, at the personnel level. So that way you wouldn't necessarily have to add each individual person in, but you can still collect fairly accurate amounts relating to the personnel, the fringe, and the indirect costs. Then we'll look at doing the more complex budgets of detailed budgeting where you add in each and every little expense and you have the system calculate those for you and we generate a detailed budget showing all those expenses. The last version here, and, and this is the largest 
coffee cup version, which is the detailed budgets with uh, formulated costs for advanced calculations. And that means that you can actually have the system identify a quantity and make the calculation based on a base cost to tell you how many um, you should how much you should request for that particular item overall. So um, that's what we'll be covering in this next section of the demonstration. So keep that in mind. I'm going to hop into our system, into a proposal that's already been created. Didn't want to waste our time going through the entire proposal process today. We do have a proposal webinar that's recorded previously that you can review if you want to see any of this general information, which also walks through the budget at a very high level. So today, we're going to focus much more on proposal budget as a whole. So I'm going to create a new proposal budget, starting with my simple summary. And I can choose summary budget here. In this new version of Kuali, we have these two options for detailed budget or summary budget. But you're still able to do either of those if you've made a selection here. What's really happening is that the system's guiding the user through to the appropriate screen to enter that information. And so this is really more of a user experience item. It's not going to hinder what you're capable of doing or not doing. OK, so I am creating my simple level budget summary, which is why it took me, the system took me on automatically to periods and totals, so that I can now intuitively just go in and enter the direct and indirect costs for each year. So I'm just going really to make this up off the fly, but let's say they're getting $100,000 a year for direct and $25,000 for indirect. And you'll notice that this is all manual entry then. So of course, the downside to this is that there's always the possibility that someone makes human error by typo. So that is one thing to keep in mind about this process. You might think to yourself, well, then why would you ever use just a simple summary level budget? And the reason for that is that um, if you have something where you're required to create a very complex budget outside of the system anyway using a specific tool. So one of the things that comes to mind for me is that like DARPA submissions, they require you to do these really complex budgets. So why do I want to, as a system, require you to manually enter in those details into our system when you, could, you will need to be submitting this other budget to them in this other format anyway. So if that's the case, it might be more beneficial for your institution to just capture those high-level summary direct costs and indirect costs. Just something to think about. OK. Um, next thing we were going to discuss is the detailed budget with just summary personnel. So I'm going to be adding my summary personnel line. So this time, I'm going to do the personnel budget version as summary still. Oh, rather, yeah, no, I'll do detailed budget. And then it allows me still to create the personnel at a summary level, even though I've selected detail there. So it takes me into this project personnel section where you do the base salary calculations. And we'll get to this when we get to our detailed budgeting. But um, I don't have to actually fill that out if I'm going to be doing summary level for personnel based on the category type. So to show you what I mean, we'll go to the Assign Personnel to Period section. I'll choose Assign Personnel. And under Person, instead of specifically choosing an individual, I can choose Summary. And then choose the category that they're associated with for that particular summary of personnel items. And so, for example, I can do one category here for tenured faculty and assign that to the period. And then when I go and choose the details action, it gives me the ability to just enter in an amount for that category of personnel, rather than having to do the intricate calculations 
for how much a particular person will be making for a particular period of time. Oops, that's a big budget. And so I can do a similar process by adding a different category for my summary personnel and show you that by doing this, I can calculate fringe automatically on that summary amount. So I'm still getting an accurate overall budget picture, but it's not forcing me to get the accurate details of a person-by-person -person situation. So depending on your situation and the type of sponsor that you're submitting for, if this is going to be a budget that you're then directly giving to the sponsor or this is a budget that's just going to be used within your calculations in your system so that you have it when the award comes through, but those are some options. So that was one place that I could show the personnel by category summary. Another way that you can do that is in our single point of entry system. And this is a configuration to allow it to display if you have um, an instance that you're working in and it's not currently showing single point of entry, it's just a parameterized option. And um, the reason why we initially created this screen was because it's great to be able to see everything that's being added to a period, um, whether it's personnel or non-personnel, to see all of that at once. But it's also something that allows you to enter in the salaries and the faculty um, for just by a category, not giving you the granular information. So with that in mind, um, just, just remember that because you're doing this at a summary level, you would never be able to use it for system-to-system -system submissions because they're always going to want to see your um, detailed budgets as you're actually requesting them. So I added personnel. Let's add something else here now. I'll do a summary expense for my travel. And then I can add that. This is also a helpful place to go if you are going to be adding lots of items um, at once, because then you can just sort of tab through and add at the end. OK, so let's see if I'm on track. We talked about the summary level budget for directs and indirects. We talked about a summary level budget where your personnel is at category level. Now we're going to move on to our budgets. So I'll return to the proposal and create a new budget version for my detailed budget. And you'll see that for your detailed budget, you would need to begin by adding in base salaries for each of the person. We do have the ability to configure this so that it ties into your HR feed with the salary information. So if you're at a public university where that's um, open information anyway, that you can have it pull in automatically. Or if you're at any institution that just wants to decrease the amount of time that um, the researchers or the budget administrator who's putting this budget together is spending on finding this background information that that's a way to save that time to them. Okay, so for each person that's coming into the system, your HR feed will be able to default a appointment type or duration that that person will be working based on their primary appointment type, but you can always come in here and make an adjustment to that, and we'll look at that a little bit later when we talk about um, salary information. So this was defaulting to 12 months, so we have a calendar year employee here. The effective date by default is going to show as the start date of your project, but if you know of a base salary amount as of a specific date and time, um, well I guess date, not really time, that <laughs> um, you can put in that time period because that's going to be what informs when this base salary first begins to apply. So I'm going to put this person at the NI, above the NIH salary cap because a little bit later on we'll be talking about how to handle the NIH salary cap. So that'll help me later. 
And if I knew that this person was making this amount of money starting in July, then I could change this to be July of last year, and then they would automatically get whatever increase so that that would be the accurate base salary at the start of this project. OK, and then after I do that, I can quickly add personnel to the personnel section. Same type of process that we followed before when we were adding summary personnel, only this time I can add the person themselves specifically, choose the category that they're associated with. Um, I think I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I just wanted to highlight it again that this object code is tied into the fringe benefits that are associated with that person. And one of the things that we really like about this system is that it's really accurate in that it does its calculations based on how much a person makes per day. And so it therefore gives them the increases as they actually hit. So you can set up in your system when their COLA would hit. And if it happens um, July 1st, then it would calculate this increase on July 1st. If this particular subcategory of people get their raises, on January 1st, then that would happen for them at a different time than the normal faculty salaries that we were just talking about. So it's really helpful that it's going to be super accurate that way, and it's always going to have your correct rates configured in the system. So the nice thing about that is that you don't have to worry about outdated, <laughs> outdated versions of some budgeting tool that's out there that you know this faculty pulls this one, or this administrative assistant who's helping pulled this one. And it's not the current version with the current rates, and you've got a budget that's out of whack. Um, so that's one of the things that's really helpful about using our budgeting system here. And then for any of these versions, whether they're the detailed summary with summary personnel, no budget, you can add in your non-personnel expenses, and you can either do those granularly with each and every tiny expense being added in, or you can do it with uh, general expenses. So you can do it just by large categories. To show you what I mean, here's one example where I could do large category. And let's say that I'm going to do $15,000 in raw materials, and I'll add that to my budget. Alternatively, <clears throat> we can do actual calculations by um, setting up in the background the configuration requirements to do formulated cost calculations, which are those really granular, this many things at this price tells me how much my total amount would be. And I've done that in this case with my outpatient services. And you'll see that after I choose to add here, I would go to my actions panel and look at the details. And there's a new area that will appear called formulated costs, where I can add a cost, and it'll actually do those calculations for me. Now, the thing to keep in mind with this is that you can tie in a cost to a particular unit or department, so that if this item falls under that unit or department, the specified cost will be associated with it. So that's really helpful in a plethora of ways. But one of those is that you can do things that, um, repl that relate to an entire university level. So if you have a school that always charges this specific amount for tuition, then you can have this come in and you enter, it automatically pops up with the tuition amount so that you don't have to worry about someone getting the wrong amount of tuition in the system. Um, that it's helpful if you have, in this case, something that's coming through a hospital where it's going to be a standardized amount, that it's always going to show that standardized amount and the calculations will be accurate because of that. So there are lots of different ways that you can leverage this to make sure that the budgets at your institution are accurate across the entire institution. Um, one of the ways that we've looked at that in the past is also like how you can potentially leverage this to calculate clinical trial budgets. But we'll go into that at another webinar. So I added x-ray. It told me that this is the amount based on where I am, which department I'm in. And then I need to sh tell the system 
how many, in this case since they're x-rays, people will be getting the x-rays, uh, 10. And then how many times over this first period will that happen? Um, let's say that they're going to go in for three different x-rays. Then I'll add the cost and it calculates for me automatically. When I save the changes, it will update here. Okay, let's hop back into the presentation and see what we're going to discuss next. And this relates back to our detailed budgets where you want to potentially have um, detailed calculations for the persons that are added to the budget. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, with that, there are a couple of questions that often come up when I'm talking to people about personnel. One of those is, well, how do I show when someone's an academic employee and they're also going to be working on this project in the summer? So we'll go over that. Then there will be situations where you know that in the future, in year two or three, that there's been a promise that this particular person will be made a full chair or some other type of promotion where they suddenly have a large increase in their salary rather than just the standard um, increase of like two or three percent year by year. And so we'll discuss how you would handle that situation. Um, there are often times in creating a budget that you know a particular task or role has to be filled, but you don't know specifically who that person is going to be yet. So for those to be assigned personnel, we have um, a really nice new tool to handle adding those into the system. So we'll discuss that. That is also something that's helpful in situations where you have um, like graduate students or research assistants that are going to be working on the project and you know who they are but you don't necessarily want to name them specifically in the project because they're not key personnel. Um, and then also there will be situations where you might want to in remove either inflation or um, indirect costs from a particular person Following along with your um, program announcement, there might be something in there that specifically tells you that this isn't acceptable in this situation and you have to follow that practice, so we'll discuss how you can do that. Okay, so back to our personnel section. And I need to make sure that one of the people I have listed here is at a nine-month appointment because if we're going to be showing someone who's an academic who's also working the summer, it makes sense for them to then have either a nine or a ten-month appointment depending on how your institution defines academic appointment. And then I'll put in a base salary. Return to the assigned personnel to a period so that I can really work on the expenses for that person. I'll choose assigned personnel and the person I just added. I can tell right away that this is the person that I wanted also because the appointment type is the appointment type that I just changed to nine months, the academic. Choose an appropriate category for the person. And then this is really the key part here, that you want to look at your start date and end date and modify those time periods so that they match the appointment type and when that person would actually be working. So an academic person will be working on a project during the school year. So um, depending again on if you're nine or ten months duration for that, you would choose when your school year actually starts for that person. And then I can put in the percentage of time that they're going to be working on this project during that academic year and change the period type to academic. This one's really just an indicator so that you can visually see on screen that this is going to be calculating at the academic year. Now I would go through and do the same exact process again for this person if they're working on, over the summer. 
Again, they show a nine-month duration. Depending on how your institution has set up when and how much the fringe rates can be applied at, you may use the same category for this person again, or if your institution does special summer rates where they're not covering a certain amount of the fringe benefit at that time, you might have a different category, so some people have um, summer for that. But if not, I'll just stick with the category that they were in before. And then I'll change the dates here so that they reflect the summertime that the person's working. Actually, this will be through July since this is. three months there. And I'll put in the amount of time that they're working over that summer period. Change the assignment to summer. And now I've accounted for both their summer and their academic work on this particular project. Okay, the next situation we wanted to talk about is what do we do when a particular person gets a big increase in the middle of their project? How do we account for that? Again, we go back to our project personnel, and we'll see that Andrew here does not yet have a base salary. Let's say that they're making $75,000 at the start of the project. And then I'll just go ahead and I'll add that person a second time. And I misspelled their last name. There we go. And you'll notice that this search here actually has a pick list with a checkbox rather than a radio button. And that means that if you want to, you can add several people at once. So if I know that I have three people that I want to add from a particular department, I can do my search by the department number instead and then pick multiple people and add them all at once. Okay, so I'm adding Andrew again for the second time. I'm going to change the effective date of when this base salary applies. So let's see, my example was as of May 2018. And then I'll give them a substantial increase at that time. Um, let's say they're going to make 97000 then. And so when I go in to assign my personnel, I can assign them for this first period at a particular amount. So we'll do the 10% effort. And then in the future, I'll have the ability for them to appear in another budget period at that increased rate instead of at this first rate. So one of the other things that you'll notice here is that on our screen to the far left, each of the categories has a details and rates section. And that's where you can modify what gets applied to that particular category. It tells me what amount and inflation is being applied for this period. So it covers two periods. So this will hit two different increases in inflation. It gives me the ability to remove that inflation so that if I want, in this year and or future years, I can not have the inflation apply. You can choose to include or disclude this from cost sharing and take it to be on or off campus. And we also have the ability to see the breakdown of the rates that are applied to this particular category. So there are a couple of different rates that are applying. This is an MTDC proposal, so it's going in with that included. But if my specific sponsor said that you cannot charge the F&A on your employees, and that's a possibility. You can uncheck that, and it wouldn't calculate that against your budget. So that's how it generally works. But 
one of the examples that we specifically wanted to cover here is, well, how do I calculate that when one person in this category does not get the inflation, but everyone else in that category? So let's use, um, let's see, um, Andrew as an example. We'll have to know this at the beginning of the process that we don't want to include the inflation for that person. And I'll add them. And they're in non-tenured on. So it's the same exact group, I'm sorry, same exact category as we saw before. But now this time I'm going to choose group and create a new group and say no inflation for this person. And now when I assign it, they'll be in their own separate listing here. So they won't be part of the large non-tenure group. They're separate. And I can choose the details and rates for that person and remove the inflation. And one of the things before we move on that um, people like to see here too is that we do have the ability to calculate future years based on the first period. So you can use that first period like a template year and then not have to manually enter information into each of the other years. Uh, before we do that, probably a good idea for me to finish my personnel. And I promised an example of how our new cool tool does the uh, TBA process. So I'll go back to project personnel and add personnel. This time, instead of doing an employee or non-employee search, I'll use the drop-down and select to be named. And you'll get a list of the maintained at your institution. Again, this is entirely configurable people that you can add as TBAs. And I'll just add the quantity of how many of those I want to appear. And when I click Add here, it automatically adds all three examples of those for me. So I don't have to continue through this process by one manually. And it automatically changes their titles here so that they're distinctly separate from one another. So they're not going to be confused and calculated as one person. One of the other clarifying things that some schools have decided to do is that you can make the job code field completely editable rather than searchable. And if you decide to do that process, you can also clarify using a code how this person is different from the other TBA that's listed. But since I already have those numbered, um, one, two, three, I don't need to do anything here. So I'll add that amount and save. And I would just continue that process updating the base salary amounts because they could potentially be different from one another for each TBI. And then you follow the same process on your assigned personnel to period section where you go in and you assign the personnel. All the different TBAs now appear in my drop down list. and I can assign them. And I would continue the same process with the second and the third TBI as needed. Um, I was sort of talking about this before when we were looking at the proposal, proposal personnel budget when we were setting it up initially. And um, I'd like to really highlight that again because that was one of the things that I always really liked about the system is that you don't have to have the person, the budget entry person, necessarily know all of the applicable rates and when things are acceptable to charge and when they're not acceptable to charge. So an example of that is here when I added a research assistant. It automatically knows, based on the configurations in the system, that this person doesn't get fringe. And so you don't have to worry about someone coming in and entering a budget and not being knowledgeable and accidentally adding this so that um, you're not getting an accurate budget system's going to take care of that for you. OK, so we added in all of our personnel. We added in some non-personnel costs. And now I can auto-calculate my periods and have all of the future years generate automatically for me.
There are two ways I can check that out. You can either flip to one of the other periods, or we also keep on the action bar at the top quick links to let you see the information as a whole from the page that you're in. And so I'll choose summary, and it'll give me a high-level summary of the budget that I'm working on, showing me all four years based off of that first year. And you can also dig down deeper if you'd like to see more of those details. So that's the personnel budgeting aspect. Let's go back into our presentation and see what we're talking about next. OK. Now on to system to system budgeting. So system to system budgeting really has to be accurate. Obviously, you want all of your budgets to be accurate, but your system-to-system -system budget truly has to be completely accurate or else you're going to be in hot water. So with that in mind, here are some of the tools that we have to help make sure to ensure that you get an accurate budget across through the system to grants.gov or research.gov. So we'll talk about how you navigate those situations where you have someone who makes more money than the NIH salary cap which sounds pretty nice to me. <laughs> um, uh, our really awesome subaward translation tool, which will take the subaward information that, in this case, is going to be going system to system and on your R and R budget, and extract the information from that and translate it into your budget for you automatically with the appropriate expenses applying where they need to. Um, one of the other cool things that we can do here in the system is change where particular expenses show on the grants.gov budgeting form. So those are automatically set up for you to show in the appropriate categories. But sometimes, <laughs> again, you might have a funding opportunity announcement where a particular situation, it needs to be considered in one category instead of another category. And so we'll go through an example of how you can have ultimate control over where things show in your R&R &R budgets. Um, we'll discuss the thinking to direct cost and how that can save you some time and headache and how you can generate modular budgets in different ways through our system. OK, so the first thing that we wanted to talk about here is that there are, um, there's the NIH salary cap, which is currently at 185.1, and that you'll need to account for that when you're adding your personnel. So let's see. The first thing you would want to do is to do that calculation on your own outside of the system because the NIH salary cap is so variable and does change pretty frequently now. You can do that in a couple of different ways. You can have like an institutional worksheet to help people figure out the salary cap where you do your calculations and then you tell them how to enter those, which is all good and well, but you can also do really simple salary cap calculations without all of that hubbub, just on your own by determining the salary cap effort, so the NIH cap, um, multiply that by the committed amount that you said you would do, and then divide that by the actual charges. So let's see, I can also quickly show you just something simple that I did right here and now to show that. So here's my NIH salary cap. That is going to be multiplied by the effort that I know I'm going to put forth on this project, and then divided by what the actual amount of their salary is, which will then tell me how much I can charge. So I come in here. Here's my PI that's over the salary cap. And we do offer the ability here to mask what the actual salary should be um, on your R&R budget so that instead it just shows you what the salary cap is. And it looks like I might have a timeout issue here. 
or I might need to be logging back in. Yep. Sorry, this is something that we have happening in our demo instance right now. There we go. <clears throat> so I'll go to the salary by period, and I can enter in the salary cap that I want to show on my r and budget forms instead. And again, unfortunately, a lot of this is open to your institutional interpretation, but um, some institutions say that this is what the base salary is, and so um, that this is the salary cap as NIH has said it is, so I'm going to show that in each of the years, and other institutions say that that's the salary cap, and my interpretation is that that's what the salary cap is right now, and that I can still get a, a COLA increase on top of that. Whatever your interpretation, and that's why this is a free text field, you can add that to show on your R&R budget forms rather than the actual salary that that person's making, since you're going to be charging against that amount in your R&R budget. Okay, so I go back to my assigned personnel to periods, and I'll make an adjustment here so that I can calculate and show the charge amount as different from the effort amount. So again, I decided ahead of time that the effort committed to this project is going to be 25%. I use my quick and dirty calculation to say that the actual charge on that, since it should be at the 185.1, is going to be 24.36. And voila, the adjustment is made. And if I look here under my details and rates, I actually meant the details, that it'll show me that that amount is showing as cost sharing. And I'll know that that is the correct calculation that I was expecting. I did want to go back to the details and rights for that person who's over the NIH salary cap, though, to show you that in those situations, you should also uncheck the submit cost sharing, since that's not true cost sharing, and you don't want it to show to the sponsor. Okay, so the next situation that we had talked about is um, that we wanted to show how you can change where something appears on the grant stock of forms and the categories that they appear on those r and budgets. So an example for this situation, I think, is that for our TBA persons, and this only applies when it comes to personnel for the non-key persons. Key persons are always going to show up in that senior personnel section, no matter what. But if you have someone who's not key, and you need to change where they appear, you can do that using the Details tab again. And under the Details and Rates. And under the Budget Category section, you can change where this person is showing. So let's say that this TBA researcher is currently actually an undergraduate student. So I can change that to be undergraduate. And then let's say that in period three, they're actually going to be graduating, and so they'll still be on this project, but then at that time they'll be a graduate student. And so during periods two and three, it'll show on the grants.gov in two separate sections. And we'll show that at the end of this system-to-system -system demonstration part. We want to get through a couple of other things before we get down to that. <clears throat> And you can do this also for your non-personnel section costs. So if you have something that's currently showing up as software, but in this situation it needs to be listed under equipment because it's so much, then you can make that adjustment too. 
the other thing I wanted to show you was the cool software translation tool. So I come into the soft subaward section, and I've already received a subaward package from my subsite on an R and R budget form. If this is going to be a system to system submission, you can choose add subaward. Look for that organization. We'll use our friends at the University of Illinois. And let's look for their subfile. Okay. And add it. And then our system goes in and it reads that PDF, pulls out the directs, the indirects. System determines how and where these should go in your non-personnel section so that it is applying the regulatory FNA at the right places and not at the wrong places. And we'll look at that just another second. But before we do that, I wanted to show for those of you who think this is a great tool and would be really helpful but aren't actually going to be doing a system-to-system -system submission that you can still use the detail section. And without adding that PDF file of the r and budget, just add in whatever information you have from your subsite as the attachment. And then come in here and manually change and enter in the direct costs and the indirect costs for each year so that it can then still calculate that into the appropriate categories for your budget. So that's helpful for all of us, but it's particularly really helpful if you ever have a situation where you have um, faculty or just normal admin, admin assistants coming in and helping do any part of the proposal budget preparation. So it came in here and it said, okay, I know that on the first $25,000 I'm allowed to charge f and in this case. So I'll go to the details section and look at the rates and you'll see that, oh yeah, it's charging f and my MTDC in this case, on that subcontract. Whereas if I go in and look at any of the other two sections for that subcontract, it's not getting that MTDC charge against it. So that's an awesome way to quickly save you some time. One of the other things here is very quickly that we can use our system to have the system adjust for you so that if you're getting close to the amount that you're requesting for a particular sponsor's mission year and you just need some help rounding up so that you're at the exact level that you're expecting and you have some wiggle room in a category like uh, material supplies or lab supplies and it can be a couple of dollars, hundred dollars off, then one of the things that we can do to help make that easier is you can use the sync to direct cost limit. Come into your periods and totals, add a direct cost limit. So let's see. Let's make this direct cost limit 70, uh, 470,000. And then I'll go to my non-personnel cost, because again, this isn't going to work on your personnel categories. They need to be specific. But for your non-personnel, we've got some wiggle room, and we can use the sync to direct cost. Choose details and then sync to direct cost limit. And you'll see that we also have the button there for sync to period cost. So if you know the total period amount, it'll do the calculation for both the direct and the indirects to make it to the amount that you're trying to reach. And instead of 15,000, now we're asking for 17,000. And it just makes that adjustment for you. <clears throat> the reason why I wanted to highlight this is because it is particularly helpful in a situation where you're doing a modular budget. We do a detailed budget that hits the modular amount that we're looking for by using that sync to, direct, sync to direct cost. Then come into modular, and you can use sync in modular as well and pull in the detailed amount that you want to show. But you'll notice that it doesn't automatically do that for you, and that's because in some situations, maybe you don't want the detailed budget to be synced in. Maybe you want to manually add your modular budget amount that you're going to request. So this isn't really a great example since I'm asking for um, like $470,000 in this case. But you could manually add in the amounts here. And have those show on your system-to-system -system modular budget. 
if I've tried this and I thought, oh no, I don't want to do that, I really like the idea of doing a sync to detail budget to have my modular budget create for me automatically. Then in that case, you just choose sync. And all of that information comes forward into your modular budget, rounding up to the appropriate module amount to request. So you'll see that in this case, my direct costs are $375,000 that I'll be requesting, even though, and I'm going to my summary to quickly show you, that the total direct costs were $470,000. So what happened there is that the system knows that I had a chunk of money there, the $110,000 that were my consortium costs, and that because of that, it's going to be um, subtracted from the total amount of my direct cost, and so that's the appropriate module for me to be requesting. Okay, so I think that that covers all of the topics that we wanted to discuss in the system-to-system -system tips and tools, but I wanted to also show you as one final wrap-up that everything that we discussed in these system-to-system -system hints um, do actually appear on your system-to-system -system budget form the way that we expect it to. So I'm going to mark my budget, and then I'll go to my system-to-system -system page and print out my budget form. And so here's my modular budget, which I would need to include if I was planning on submitting my modular budget, as well as my detailed budget. We want to look at the detailed budget this time, though, because we mostly did changes to show how we change things from categories or we're doing things with the NIH salary cap, and that's not going to appear in my modular budget. So here we go. Uh, here's my PI, Audrey Martin, and there they are at the salary cap for NIH. That calculation's happening. And then here's also the change that I made where my person was listed as an undergraduate student and then as a graduate student. So here they are as an undergraduate student, and in the following year they got that boost to be a graduate student. Okay, so this is the point, uh, the end of our presentation, and I'd like to open it up to any questions that you may have. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Susan, for, uh, for taking us all through that. It's great to have your, your expertise. As we can see, there's a lot of different ways to handle budgets and shown us a lot of different ways you can do it. So we have had a lot of questions come in. If you're on the line and have, uh, have not had a chance to answer your question, feel free to type it in. As you can see with the time, we've only got about five minutes, so we'll definitely not be able to get through all of them. Uh, but we will follow up with you afterwards as well as send along a link to the recording of this webinar. Um, in the next day or two so that you can share that with anyone who um, you think might find this interesting. Uh, but let's, let's just jump straight to it through the questions uh, so we can get through as many as we can in the next few minutes. Um, first question is, how do I know if I need to do a summary budget or a detailed budget? So that's really going to be entirely up to your institution. Your sponsors are often going to want to see a detailed budget. But whether your institution requires you to do that in our system or do it in whatever paperwork that your sponsor may require, um, because of that, if you are required to do a budget on a different specific form outside of the system and your institution says, hey, it's OK for you to just do a summary budget, then that's when you can do a summary budget. It's really um, an additional option to make your life easier, not necessarily something that's going to ever be required. I see. Well, and we've got a related question on this topic of, you know, can, can my school mix and match approaches when I'm doing summary and it's Like some proposals have a detailed budget and some proposals just have a summary. Is that possible? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So um, a lot of situations for schools, they feel like they prefer to do summary level budgets, um, just to, especially as they're getting used to the system. But then when you're doing system to system, it's absolutely required that you have to do a detailed budget. So in that case, you would do both. You would have some sponsors, some proposals that you're doing a summary level budget and other 
sponsors like NIH or NSF that you'll have to do a detailed budget. Great, that makes both. sense. It's nice to have that flexibility, I can see. Um, next question we've got is where do the objects codes, where do the object codes come from and can they be configured specifically for my institution? Oh yeah, absolutely. So the system is highly, highly configurable and what you saw things named as, like the object codes, are specifically things that are put in at the time that we're setting up your records and um, we can call object codes, whether they be for personnel or for non-personnel, whatever makes sense for your institution. Some people might call something telecommunications, some people might call something else phone records. And so that's entirely up to you at the time you set it up at an institutional level. Good deal. Let's see, next question we have, um, and I'm just going fast just to see if we can get through as many of these. So um, could you please explain <laughs> the use of the salary anniversary date versus salary effective date? Ah, yes. So some institutions will set up a standardized salary anniversary date, and um, that means that you can expect to always get this inflation for this person at this particular time, um, whereas the effective date is just going to be saying that this salary applies, this base salary specifically applies at this particular time. And if there's an anniversary date associated later down the line, then that will apply in the future. I hope that helps explain it. I think so, and certainly on, on, on all of these questions, if you've got follow-up questions, don't hesitate to, to reach out to us. We can, Susan, as you can tell, can go into a lot more detail about these, so we want to make sure we get your answers, uh, get your answers to your questions. So um, next up is, what if I have a budget with separate tasks or cores by different departments? Oh, that's a good question. So if you want different departments to have access to doing their own task or core in the budget with different rates that may be applying to that department as opposed to the main department. Um, we would then, in that case, have to do something called a proposal hierarchy. And um, we actually plan to do a webinar session on proposal hierarchy in August. So keep an eye out for that, and we can go through that. It's a little bit more detailed, and so that's why we didn't cover it today. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'm looking at the time and I want to be mindful. I know everybody's got a busy schedule. So I want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, we do have a lot.